Hi, I'm Dawn Shaughnessy. I'm the Division Leader for Nuclear and Chemical Sciences Division here at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and welcome to the NAX Division. If there's a way to summarize what we do in our division, it's nuclear science and security. They're, they're very well aligned in a lot of ways. And in fact, a lot of times we're asking the same kind of question, what's the origin of this? How did we get here? Our research covers a wide breadth of topics, everything from working on current issues and climate, looking at how to sequester carbon, studying water in California, looking at forensics, what a material is made of, who is trying to use that material and what for, looking at the nucleus itself, the basic building block of matter. We're also looking at our own cosmos, including the age of our, our solar system, and that's just a few of the topics that we work on here in the NAX division. What cosmochemistry is, is the study of samples to try and understand the origin and evolution of the solar system. Another aspect of research that we focus on is how do the planets form and evolve? We know that they start off as tiny little dust particles and they eventually accrete and they form into cores, mantles, and crusts. And so trying to understand how those processes work and when those processes work is the second major component of what we do. Is we make measurements either at a fidelity that they haven't been made before, so ultra high precision, or we figure out ways to analyze materials that are extremely small so that we can make measurements on things that no one has been able to do before. And having access to the myriad different types of tools to address a single problem is really what makes NACs and, and, and our facility unique here. We have instruments like the one behind me, which is relatively off the shelf, to instruments across the hall here that are one of a kind, built specifically to do specific tasks that are related both to cosmochemistry and nuclear forensics. We're, we're trying to gear ourselves towards sample return missions. But the really big thing on the horizon is the Artemis program. It's the number one objective of the NASA Space Agency. The Artemis program is going to be bringing back vast amounts of material from a very different portion of the moon from what we've studied before. And so this allows us, first of all, to identify and study a different part of the moon that we haven't seen, but also to take the models that we've developed from things on the near side, collected predominantly by Apollo, and test whether those ideas are applicable on a global scale. Linus is the Livermore Nuclear Science Center. It's an acronym that we're, it's the working name for, for what we think it will be a capability that we want to bring to the lab. Uh, and essentially this building that we're in right now is a series of caves that are underground. Uh, and those caves provide a lot of shielding. It allows us to build an accelerator, build an accelerator facility, build capabilities that we wouldn't be able to do elsewhere here. Linus is envisioned to do neutron cross-section measurements. A pulsed tunable neutron source doesn't exist anywhere else. And that's gonna be the core capability that Linus would bring to the lab. So these are measurements that we haven't been able to make that we'd be able to make with this machine at Livermore. And the idea is that if we can make that machine more compact, we can sort of fit that machine in the cave structure that we have. If we could make things smaller, we were more excited about it. And so we had looked at how to make the accelerator smaller itself, which is the core piece or the, one of the biggest drivers on the links. Uh, accelerator physics is a very broad field. And so there's a real opportunity or a real chance to, to sort of touch all of those pieces of the machine from, from the application and the modeling of it all the way back through every piece of the machine that needs to get built up and work together. It's a very complicated system, um, but at the same time, it's exciting because it's sort of as complex as one person can kind of hold in their head. They might not be able to touch every bolt or turn every screw, um, but they can get close. And then that's something that I really love about it. Uh, and again, as a constrained problem, it gets a little bit more exciting. You know, you have to do something a little bit new to make it all work. If this were easy, you know, it wouldn't be as interesting. We, um, over the past century or two, have been putting carbon in our atmosphere in a number of different ways. Um, obviously by burning fossil fuels, we've done that, but also just through the practice of agriculture. 
the reason that I'm deeply committed to this concept of carbon sequestration is really just we need to get it out of the atmosphere and put it back in the ground. There's a lot of benefits when we have carbon in our soils. Um, that We call it organic matter and it's got nutrients in it and it helps plants grow and you know helps hold water better. So it's super important for our ecosystems and, and agricultural ecosystems in particular. But we do field work in a number of sites. We do lots here in California. Um, I chose this spot because right next to me is our charismatic megafauna plant called Avena barbata. And this is just um, probably to many people a weed. But this plant is what we've studied for um, over a decade um, to try and understand how it interacts with microbes and the biogeochemistry of soil. The thing that's really hard with tracking carbon is there's a lot of carbon, but we need to have a way of really tracking the new carbon that's just been fixed and kind of watching it move through the ecosystem. It's almost like we wish we could have a fluorescent molecule that we could just kind of trace through the system. But we kind of do have that in that we can trace isotopes. And that's what Nax has been uh, just a powerhouse in for years, that we can look at 13 carbon, that's the rare isotope, it's only a 1% isotope, and we can look at how much has been fixed in the plant, how much gets into the DNA of microbes in the soil. When it gets stuck onto the surfaces of minerals, we can look at its chemistry. So not just how much, but what type. I'll be honest that I am an optimist. I'm an idealist. I'm excited about this work because I really know that we are in a climate crisis and we've got to solve this problem. We still have too much CO2 in the atmosphere and we've got to do work to pull it out, to actively um, put it in the ground. And, and so that excites me. It makes me get up and feel like, nope, we got to keep pushing on this work. I'm passionate about it. The fundamental question we're trying to answer is why do we exist? The more scientific specific question we're trying to ask is why do we live in a matter dominated, stable universe? Because that's not a given. We don't have any theories or laws to understand why that is the case backed up by data. There is a theory though that the neutrino could be the source of that instability in the early universe between matter and antimatter that allowed it to become and evolve stably into a matter dominated universe. It is that property of the neutrino that we're trying to study with all this work. The problem we're trying to solve is to observe an extremely rare nuclear decay. Um, and that decay only happens in a few nuclei and there's a few that are very uh, attractive for us and one is, is xenon. So we're using xenon and we need to observe the xenon and look for a one little nuclear decay to occur. And that decay then tells us about the neutrino. And in order to do that, we need to build a detector nexo that is about 10 million times less radioactive than common materials. So the chair you sit in, the, the floor, is all relatively radioactive compared to what we're building. So that's the first major challenge, is how do you build something that's 10 million times less radioactive? In addition to that, we're constantly getting cosmic rays raining down on us. And so that we got to get out of that environment somehow. And so the way we do that is we bury the detector deep underground. In fact, we go two kilometers underground and we use a detector called a time projection chamber, which allows us to observe the light and charge that's produced in these events. And from those, we can infer how the decay occurred and, and what exactly it is and, and try to find that one decay that tells us, you know, the nature of the neutrino. Does the neutrino behave as its own antiparticle? If it does behave in that way, that then bolsters that theory to allow us to understand why we exist. So one of the uh, primary missions of the, uh, of the lab is uh, nuclear security and nuclear deterrent. And in fact, one of the physical process that is at the heart of a nuclear weapon is nuclear fission. Uh, and Surprisingly, a lot of the information we have about nuclear fission is in fact uh, is coming from experimental measurements and we don't really have a comprehensive theoretical model of what exactly is going on. And so the goal of my team is to try to develop a fundamental first principle theory of the nuclear fission process. It's both a physicist's dream and a physicist's nightmare, uh, which, is, which explains why it's exciting but also why it's difficult. Uh, fission sort of compounds all the possible challenges you've, you can face when you're trying to solve a physics problem. It is a quantum mechanical system, quantum mechanics is not easy. Uh, it is, it requires a lot of computing, so you need to know also about how to program and how to run on big machines. Uh, in terms of physics, it's a time dependent problem, it's a, it's a system where uh, particles are emitted, particles are captured, 
So it's, it's not in equilibrium, so you, you have to really uh, be knowledgeable about many different aspects of not just nuclear science, but science in general. So that makes it exciting, that also makes it very difficult. <laughs> The lab does nuclear forensics research, pre-detonation and post-detonation. Pre-detonation nuclear forensics is the technical analysis of nuclear and radiological materials that are out of regulatory control. Whereas post-detonation nuclear forensics is the technical analysis of debris samples that would have come from an unattributed nuclear detonation. So the lab has expertise to analyze such samples, to answer questions like what is the material, when and where was it produced, and what type of neutron flux was it exposed to, if any. We have different techniques that we use for this, such as radiochemistry, mass spectrometry, microscopy, autoradiography, amongst others. Now the challenge is here that the radiochemistry can take a while, particularly when we have large volumes of solution. So what we are trying to do is use microfluidics, which is doing um, chemistry on microliters at a time, which allows for handling a much smaller sample volume and thus decrease analytical time. Ultimately, our vision for this project is that we'd be developing a fully fieldable platform, put them in a case and take them into the field. In the very unlikely event of a nuclear detonation, an early responder could take this with them and measure early time data which can be reported back in the time other samples are being shipped back to the labs for detailed analysis. We also get to iterate on our designs rapidly. All of our microchips that we use, we 3D print in-house, which means that we can change the design. We can go from conception to actually testing our new platform in a matter of days. I think what is both exciting and challenging about the work is the complexity of the samples. These samples, um, because of the number of nuclear reactions that can be occurring, contain a very large proportion of elements that are present in the periodic table, which means that the research is dynamic and we get to do chemistry on different elements all the time. We're never boxed into studying only one element and that's really fun for me and keeps it exciting in the lab. The climate is changing and it's warming. And what it means for the Western US is that the snowpack that we rely on for our drinking water supply is gonna disappear. Um, and now it comes down in rivers around late spring and middle of the summer, that's gonna move earlier. So we need a place to store that water. And the best place to store that water is on the ground. We've depleted our aquifers and this is an opportunity to replenish our aquifers. Um, but the question is how to do that most efficiently, do it in a way that's safe for drinking water and also support ecosystems that rely on that groundwater. We're standing right next to Arroyo Mocho in Livermore and we chose this spot because it's close to the lab and we can test out our isotopic techniques to trace where the water comes from that is in the Arroyo right now, whether it comes from local groundwater or from upstream. And we can also use our isotopic tools to trace that water as it recharges the Livermore aquifer. And we're relying on a number of different isotopes. Um, but because they're radioactive, they have this time signal inherently incorporated in their isotope ratios. So the more we see of them, the younger the water is, and we, we see very little of the isotopes, we know it's getting older and older. We've worked with the USGS a lot in the Central Valley, and they've been all across the state sampling and working for the state water boards. And together, we've analyzed many of those samples and now we have this large data set that we can mine for understanding where water comes from on a much larger scale than just looking at the arroyo here. So when we've looked at that data for the San Joaquin Valley, we found that 50% of the water, the groundwater in the San Joaquin Valley, actually originated as one of the rivers that came down of the Sierra Nevada. And that's a really important finding because that means that there is already a natural mechanism of, for that river water to recharge the aquifers. We just need to figure out how we can do that more efficiently. And knowing that, we can also know where we might want to expand on recharge facilities that actively push that water into the ground. I think it's really cool that the natural processes in our environment create these isotopic clues for us to detect and to monitor and to examine and that with those isotopic clues we can figure out where the water came from, how long it's been underground and 
we can use those techniques and those advanced tools we have at the laboratory to answer questions that are really relevant to society and try to answer questions that help us adapt to climate change and help us secure water for future generations. So the scientists and NACs do work for basic fundamental science, but also even more important is application to our laboratory's mission space. Our scientists do work in all the major laboratory missions, including the National Ignition Facility, global security, as well as helping with our stockpile stewardship mission. We've also got just an incredibly exciting future here. How are we going to use uh, machine learning to help our scientists in, in all different situations? How can we better use uh, quantum information science, quantum detection, quantum computing? These are some of the areas that we're, we're looking into here at NAX. We work on science at the very extremes of uh, everything. 